I'm Sujani, faculty in physics at Institute of Aeronautical Engineering, Hyderabad. Today, we are going to discuss one important experiment in quantum physics, that is Davison and Germer experiment. Let us look at the brief outline of the topic that we are going to discuss today. So first, we are going to see the theories behind the experiment. So whenever you have to do an experiment, you need to know what is the theory that exists behind the experiment. Without knowing the theory, you cannot perform the experiment. Now, we will also talk about the expectations, that is the outcomes, I can say. What is the outcome you are expecting from that experiment? Uh, because whenever we do an experiment, we do it with certain expectations. Uh, for example, I will give you the Ohm's law. You are trying to verify Ohm's law. Again, I am giving you the example of Ohm's law, which is the simplest one. V upon I is equal to R. So when you are doing the experiment, you will connect a circuit. The simplest connection you can do is uh, you will have a supply, you will have a resistance and then you will have an ammeter to measure the current and then a voltmeter to measure the voltage across it. Now you keep on uh, varying the current and measure the voltage across the resistance. So, for varying a V, you have different values of current. And you already know the Ohm's law. So, whenever you are doing the experiment, what is your expectation here is the ratio of V upon I. Whatever variations you do in voltage and current, so the ratio always has to be a constant. So that is what I'm talking about the expectation here. So the theory behind here is you should know what is Ohm's law. And second thing is what is your expectation out of the experiment. Then comes the experimental study. How you go about the ex doing the experiment. The procedure which you will follow. And then how do you analyze the results. So, we are going to understand these concepts with the help of Davison and Germer experiment. So, uh, a word of uh, caution for all those who are very much interested in experiments or interested in projects or those who want to take research forward. Uh, what is the method you have to follow while doing an experiment? It's a great learning from this experiment of Davison and Germer where he started, how he started and how he uh, uh, concluded with uh, a beautiful result which helped or which formed a strong base for quantum mechanics we are going to understand in this experiment. Now coming to the first point that is the theory behind the experiment. Atomic models proposed by scientists un until 19th century could explain the particle nature of electrons but fail to explain the properties related to the wave nature. Means when they have taken light, radiation which has got wave nature, they said it can behave like particle. So we have the experiments of interference and diffraction here which proves the wave nature and then we also have this uh, black body radiation photoelectric effect and Compton effect which helped us to understand the particle nature. Now when it comes to matter is said to have particle nature. So we can see the elementary particles, they exist 
as particles. Matter is composed of elementary particles. Now, they said it can behave like a wave. But there was no evidence to prove the wave nature. There is no evidence to prove the wave nature. Because it could only explain the particle nature of electrons, but it failed to explain the properties related to wave nature. So, you need some demonstration or some evidence to accept the wave nature of matter. So, the theory, what is the background for this experiment? I am telling you. Then this scientist by name, Walter M. Elsasser, in the year 1920, he remarked that wave-like nature of matter might be investigated by electron scattering experiments on crystalline solids. Okay, this scientist, what he, he did not do any experiment. He only gave a suggestion. What he said, that is why we are writing here, might be investigated. So, because at that time there were experiments which were going on with X-rays. And the wave-like nature of X-rays was confirmed with X-ray scattering experiments on crystalline solids. So, there, at that time when there was no experiment to prove the wave nature of electrons, this scientist, what was the suggestion he gave is, we are trying to prove or we are, we are successful in proving the wave nature of X-rays using X-ray scattering experiments on crystalline solids. So, we can apply the same thing to particles also to prove their wave-like nature. So, this was the suggestion. By considering their bombardment, the particles when they are falling on a crystalline solid, how they behave. So, maybe with the help of that, we can establish this wave-like nature. This was a suggestion that was given by the scientist Elsasser. Then, Another scientist by name Davison, he was working on the study of electron bombardment and secondary electron emissions. He was already working on electron beam and when it is falling on a crystal, how are the emissions? How are the electrons reflected from the crystal? Okay, that is what Davison was studying. And he did a series of experiments till 1925. You see here he started his study in the year 1921. And he did a series of experiments till 1925. So we can understand the perseverance of Davison. And you will also as we go through the uh, experiment you will understand how he connected things logically and how he established certain facts. So, actually when he was uh, doing the experiment in 1921, the experiment, the actual objective was to study the surface of a piece of nickel. So, he has taken a piece of nickel means he started taking a crystalline solid of nickel and he wanted to know how the surface is, means how smooth the surface is. No? Whenever we are talking about a crystal, so at that time when uh, the facts were not established regarding the crystal planes or the lattice planes, how the atoms are arranged and all that, that time he was trying to find out how smooth the surface is of a crystal. So how he was doing the experiment, he was directing a beam of electrons at the surface and he is observing how many electrons bounced off at various angles. So, when there are electrons that are bombarded onto this crystal, this is a nickel crystal. What he was trying to find is how are they being reflected. So, at different points depending upon the surface, so they may be bounced off at different angles. Now, what was his expectation? I told you, for every ex experiment, we will have an expectation. So, what he expected is, because of the small size of electrons, you know the size of the electron of the order of 10 power minus 10 meter. For different electrons of different atoms, but average approximately, 
of the order of 10 power minus 10 meter. Even the smoothest crystal surface would be too rough. No? When I am taking a surface, even if the surface is very smooth, because the size of the electrons that are bombarding it is very small, okay, this surface may be too rough and the electrons may experience diffused reflection, means they may go in different directions, they may diffuse. That is what uh, he observed or he expected. And in the experiment, what he did is, he took a electron beam, okay, and from an electron gun. There is an electron gun, usually you have a filament with a supply, when current flows through it, it gets heated up and it emits electron. Suppose there is an electron beam that is coming out and this is falling on the nickel crystal. So what is the experiment consisting of? It consists of firing of an electron beam. So this is the electron gun. And this is the beam of electrons, electron beam. And this is the nickel crystal. It is incident perpendicular to the surface of the crystal. And now, after incident, how are they reflecting at different angles? So, he tried to measure how the number of reflected electrons varied as the angle between the detector and the nickel surface varied. So, to know how many electrons have deflected in at a particular angle. So, he kept a detector here to detect these electrons and as the angle between the detector and the nickel plate varies, how is the number of electrons varying? That is what he was trying to find out. And then, to avoid collisions of electrons with the atoms. So, the electrons are emitted from the electron gun and they have to be incident on the nickel plate. But when these electrons are traveling and before hitting the nickel target on their way towards the surface, the experiment was conducted in a vacuum chamber. He wanted to avoid the collision of these electrons with any other atoms, maybe in air. Okay, so in order to prevent that collisions of these electrons with other atoms, he conducted it in a vacuum chamber. What is a vacuum chamber? From which we are removing the uh, air also and creating vacuum inside. What is the reason for most of the experiments we do, where we see about electric discharge and all, all of them are uh, done in a vacuum chamber. The main reason for it is, to avoid collisions with other atoms. So, to measure the number of electrons that are scattered at different angles, a Faraday cup electron detector that would be moved on an arc path about the crystal was used. I have already explained it to you. So, if this is the beam of electrons, this is the nickel crystal. So, these are the electrons that are reflected. So, you may find them at different angles. Now, here we will use a Faraday cup electron detector. Faraday is the name of the scientist. To collect them, we are using a cup shape because it is very easy to collect. So, this is a shape and this is again connected to a deflection magnetometer. So, whatever electrons, so this can be moved along the scale. So, at whatever angle they are deflected, you may be able to collect by changing the angle between the nickel crystal and the detector. This is the Faraday cup detector. So, by changing the angle, you are able to capture the electrons which are getting deflected at various angles. Now, the dis detector was designed to accept only elastically scattered electrons. Elastically scattered here means where energy is conserved. The energy should not be lost into the surroundings. So, whenever an election, whenever a collision happens here, the total energy before collision should be equal to the total energy after collision. That is what we consider in elastically scattered electrons. 
Now, during the experiment, even though he was conducting it in a vacuum chamber, air accidentally entered the chamber. Huh? So, all this uh, setup was kept in an uh, evacuated chamber. And uh, then what happened suddenly? Air accidentally entered the chamber. So, when there is air, it produced an oxide film on the nickel surface. He wanted to study the surface uh, of the nickel plate. But then there is an oxide film that is formed. No? When it reacts with the oxygen in the air, there is a film that is formed. So, which uh, made him very difficult for him to study the surface. So, he had to remove the oxide film that is formed. So, to remove the oxide film, what he did, he heated the specimen at a high temperature in an oven. So, he has to remove the oxide film and then continue with his experiment. So, in order to remove the oxide film, he heated the nickel plate in a oven at a very high temperature. But what happened because of this heating? He did not have any idea regarding that, what will happen. But what happened is, it caused the formerly polycrystalline structure of nickel to form a large single crystal. You see here, he did not have an, any idea of what happened. So, sometimes when doing experiments, you expect the unexpected. So, what was his intention? His intention was there should not be any other collision. So, we will conduct the experiment in a vacuum chamber. So, he managed with uh, conducting the experiment in a vacuum chamber. But accidentally what happened? Some air entered into the vacuum chamber. And because of that, there is a nickel oxide uh, that is formed. And because of which he, he was not able to find the surface, crystal surface, he was not able to find how smooth it is. So, what he did is he heated it in an oven. Okay. And then because of the heating, what happened? This polycrystalline structure is now turning into a large single crystal. So, here you need to understand what is a polycrystalline structure and what is a single crystal. If you see a crystal, a single crystal, the, it is. It has got uniform crystal lattice. All the arrangement of atoms is uniform. But when you see a polycrystalline structure, it is not uniform. Okay. So, now because of the heating, this polycrystalline structure turned into a single crystal with crystal planes that are continuous over the width of the electron beam. Now, the crystal planes arranged themselves no, in continuous, continuous manner. They are now in a continuous manner. If you see in a polycrystalline structure, they are not continuous because if I talk about a nickel crystal, we can talk in terms of different planes. So, I can talk about this plane or this plane, this plane, they are continuous like this. But it is not the same in case of a polycrystalline. So, now whatever experiment he was doing, now he is doing in a large single crystal. So, because of that, what he observed, when they started doing the experiment again and the electrons hit the surface, they are now scattered by the regularly spaced nickel atoms. There is no more a polycrystalline uh, nickel uh, surface. So, what happened? They are scattered by the regularly spaced nickel atoms in the crystal planes of the crystal. So, this generated a diffraction pattern with unexpected peaks. So, this is in the year 1925. He was doing a series of experiments, I told you. So, in 1925, what he observed is, this gave rise to a diffraction pattern with unexpected peaks. Unexpected peaks because of the regularly spaced nickel atoms. Now, he collaborated with another scientist also. His name is L. H. Germer. In the year 1927, they carried out an experiment, which we now call it as the famous Davison and Germer experiment, to explain the wave nature of electrons through electron diffraction. So, what uh, idea he got from that particular experiment he was doing is, when he observed the diffraction phenomena, 
after bombarding the electrons on the nickel plate, he could observe a, a uniform diffraction pattern. Then it struck that if radiation can show diffraction phenomena and electrons are also undergoing diffraction, then the wave nature of electrons can be established using this particular diffraction phenomenon. So, this became the first experimental evidence of matter waves. So, he did not think of proving the wave nature of electrons. He was doing some other experiment in which he observed that the electrons are undergoing diffraction. So, he thought, so the same can be applied to understand the wave nature. So, he continued doing experiments in that particular direction. Now, what is the experiment uh, setup? What it consists of? So, it consists of an electron gun. What is an electron gun? It consists of a filament which is connected to a battery. Okay. So, when this uh, filament is heated with the help of this battery, the electrons are emitted from this. So, we call it as electron gun. So, the electrons that are emitted will now pass through a slit or we call it as collimator. What is this? This is a collimator. What is a collimator? Because when electrons are emitted from this electron gun, they may go in different directions. No, also along. But when we want them to strike, we want a fine beam and they have to hit the target perpendicular, no, and normal to the target. So, we are using a collimator here. Collimator is used to collimate the rays or to collimate to get a fine uh, incident beam. So, this beam is now incident on the nickel target. So, after being hit, so the diffracted beam is going at different angles. So, we are using a detector, a detector to detect the diffracted beam. The beam that is uh, diffracted due to the nickel target, we are collecting here. So, it may come at different angles. So, depending upon the diffraction, it may come. So, we are trying to move this detector. We are calling it as a movable detector. So, the detector can be moved along a circular arc. We say. So, we will move and we will be able to collect the electron or the diffracted beam that is coming at different angles. And the entire setup, we are keeping it in a vacuum chamber. Why? Because to avoid the collisions of these electrons with other atoms and also to prevent the oxidation of this nickel target. There should not be any oxide that should be formed on the nickel target. And also here we have a setup to produce a very high voltage. This is to accelerate the electrons. This is for what? To accelerate the electrons. The electrons that are emitted from the gun, they have to move fast, straight, that is normal and hit the target. In order to accelerate them, make them move fast, we maintain a high potential between this and the target. Of course, this will be connected to the target. Only then it will be maintained at a very high potential. So, whenever there is a difference in potential, they will always rush from a higher potential to the lower potential. So, what we are doing here is connect it from to a, a variation applying a potential so that the uh, electrons will be accelerated. So, this is the setup. Uh, we will try to understand each part by part because uh, whenever you are asked to explain, you will have to explain the different components in uh, the experiment and their function. What is the function? What is the purpose uh, for what you are using that in the experiment? So, the apparatus consists of electron gun G. The, the first part is the electron gun G. 
where electrons are produced. So when we have to study the nature of electrons, so we need electrons. So the electrons are produced with the help of electron gun. And when the filament of the electron gun is heated to dull red means how you are heating it, you have connected it to a battery as said when uh, there is a supply, this filament gets heated up and it will emit electrons. You have to heat it till dull red huh? to a high temperature, then only the electrons are emitted and these electrons we call them as thermionic emissions. Thermal is always related to heat. So the electrons that are uh, emitted due to the heating up of the element, that is why we are calling it as thermionic emission. So the function of the electron gun is to produce the electron electrons. How are we getting the electrons? By heating the filament. And the process uh, by which these electrons are emitted, we are calling it as thermionic emission. Now, these electrons are accelerated in the electric field of known potential difference. I said we have this setup to accelerate the electrons of known potential. See here, you can apply a varied potential. This arrow here shows that you can apply a varied potential. You can apply it depending upon the requirement. So a very high potential is applied no? so that the electrons are accelerated. So what is the function of this setup here? Is to accelerate the electrons. Next thing is the collimator. They are collimated by suitable slits. Why do we have to collimate? Because we want a fine beam of electrons. So, what, where is the collimator? This is the collimator, which is used to collimate the rays. And this is the slit. You can see the slit here. So, electrons that enter, they come here. And all the other electrons that are coming out in different directions are stopped. So, we are collimating them as a fine beam. Okay. And these electrons are targeted. This fine beam is directed to fall on the nickel crystal. So, this is the nickel crystal which we call as the target. Target means uh, where these electrons have to go and hit. Okay, that we are calling it as the target. Now, after striking the target, the electrons scatter in different directions. So, once they hit the target, depending upon the lattice, okay, they will be scattered in different directions and the beam of electrons produced has a certain amount of intensity. What do we mean by intensity? More the number of electrons that are emitted in that particular direction, more the intensity. And you can measure it with the help of an electron detector. You use an electron detector to collect the electrons. And if the electrons, the number of electrons uh, in that direction is more, then the intensity is more. Okay, now the electron detector is connected to a sensitive galvanometer to read the current. So, current is due to the flow of electrons. So, when you have the electrons and you connect it to a galvanometer, that will read the current for us. And then it is moved on a circular scale. I told you the purpose because the electrons are coming, the beam, the diffracted beam is coming in different directions. So, you need to move the detector, whatever uh, Faraday cup detector you are taking here. So, it has to be moved on a circular scale. Now, by moving the detector on a circular scale at different positions, by changing the angle theta, this is very important here. What is angle theta here? It is angle between the incident and the scattered electron beams. So, when you change this angle, the intensity of the scattered beam is measured for different values of angles of scattering. So, you are changing the angles. So, as the angle varies, then the diffracted beam also changes and you are capturing this beam at different angles. Now, what are the observations of uh, Davison and Germer from this experiment? 
the variation of intensity of the scattered electrons was changing by changing the angle of scattering. So, if the angle varies, the intensity also varies. And by changing the potential difference, the accelerated voltage is varied from 44 volt to 68 volt. So, what he was doing is he was also varying the potential difference that is applied to the electrons for them to move. So, he was conducting the experiments with varying voltage and varying angles. So, what he observed is as the angle varies also the intensity is varying and also it is varying with the potential that is applied. Now, if you see the diagrammatical representation, so this is the nickel crystal we have taken. This is the crystal, different atoms and these lines which we show are the crystal lattice or the plane we say. Okay. So, this is one plane and this is another plane. Now, the beam is coming and striking the target. Okay. Suppose I am taking the reflection from this plane. Okay. So, the beam is reflected like this. It is incident and it is reflected. So, you can measure the angle between the incident beam and the reflected beam and you also need to know the distance between the two lattices because you may have another reflection which may come from here. Okay, so that is why we need to know D also. So, you hope you understood how the beam is incident, how it is getting reflected because of the crystal. Now, uh, if you see here, I said he conducted the experiment with varying voltages and at different angles. Two things he was varying. One is the angle at which it is incident, the angle between the incident beam and the reflected beam when it is varying and also the potential that is applied. Now, he has uh, calculated if this is the beam that is incident on the crystal, at this particular voltage. So, now he counted the number of electrons that are reflected in this particular direction at this particular angle and he has plotted a graph. So, at 40 volts you see the graph is this and as you keep on increasing the voltage you may find slight variations in intensity. There is a kink here, okay, and this is becoming more prominent. And at 44 old, this is very important. At 44 old and an angle of 50 degree, what he has seen is the intensity. There is a very strong peak, sharp peak, we can say here. At what? At an angle of 50 degree and 54 old, this peak is maximum, I can say. There is a strong peak in the intensity of the beam that is collected. And again, still further, if you increase, the peak is going down again. So, what he observed is the peak is maximum. He has considered these two values after conducting a series of experiments with varying voltages and at different angles. He has observed that the peak is maximum at 54 volt and 50 degree. Now, he used the same thing to calculate the values of lambda. That is the wavelength of electrons. So, now we will leave the other uh, angles and also at other potentials. We will now only focus on 54 volt and 50 degrees. What happened? So, when the beam is incident, and is reflected if the angle between them is 50 degree and the voltage at which it is applied is 54 volt, we are seeing that the peak is maximum. And the distance between these two planes we are call as a D is 0 0.91 angstrom. So, we know whenever we are measuring a small distances, we measure it in angstrom because 1 angstrom is 10 power minus 10 meter. Okay, so this is what he worked on further.
Now, what are his observations? With the intensity of the scattered electrons for an accelerating voltage of 54 volt at an angle of theta, he could see a strong peak in the intensity. And what was the reason behind this peak is, it is a result of the constructive interference of electrons scattered from different layers of regularly spaced atoms of the crystal. So, I have uh, uh, shown you these planes are very regularly spaced. So, whatever reflections that are coming from different planes, this is one plane, this is the other plane. So, these reflections that are happening, they are interfering with each other. There is constructive interference means uh, where the crest of one wave falls on the crest. That is how we try to understand the constructive interference. So, because of that, what is happening? there is a peak and this is coming from different layers of the regularly spaced atoms. Now, with the help of electron diffraction, the wavelength of these matter waves was calculated. So, we, he has got two values now. The value of the voltage applied is 54 volt and the angle at which they are reflected back is 50. So, the value, calculated value is 0.165 nanometer. This is nanometer means it is 0.165 into 10 power minus 9 meter. Now, how we are going to determine this value of lambda using Bragg's law. What is Bragg's law? Bragg is the name of the scientist. So, he gave a law and lambda is equal to 2d sin theta. This is the Bragg's law. He used Bragg's law for experimental determination. So, he has to calculate the value of lambda from the experiment. So, he used n lambda is equal to 2d sin 90 minus theta by 2 because we want the value of theta here. That is the angle between So, if this is the angle 50 between the incident beam and the reflected beam. Now, a part of it, if I uh, draw this, this is only 25. Yes, half of it. Now, I want the angle between this and this. This crystal plane and the incident beam. So, if this is 25 and this total angle is 90, so, this will be definitely 65. Hope you try to understand how you are getting 65. I want the angle between the plane and the incident beam, this angle. So, how I am getting this angle? If I drop a, a line here or divide this angle, this will be 25 and 90 minus 25 will give us 65. So, we are using the formula n lambda is equal to 2d sine 90 minus theta by 2. 90 minus theta by 2 will give us what? 65. That is what we are doing. n is equal to 1. n is the order we are taking as uh, 1. And d is the spacing between the planes. That is 0 0.091 nanometer. There we were talking in terms of angstrom. So, if I write uh, 0 0.91 angstrom, that is 0 0.91 into 10 to the power of minus 10 meter. Uh, here I am talking in terms of 0 0.091 nanometer. Nanometer means what? 10 to the power of minus 9. So, here we are writing in terms of nanometer. 0 0.091 into 10 power minus 9 into sine 65. How we are getting sine 65? Theta is equal to 50. So, 50 by 2 is 25. So, 90 minus 90 minus 50 by 2. So, that gives us 65. So, the value of lambda we are getting as 0 0.165 nanometer. This is what we are using or getting from the experimental. Experimental determination, whatever experiment we did and we got the value of the angle using the Bragg's law we have got the value of lambda to be 0 0.165 nanometer.
Now we will see the theoretical calculation. So we know the formula given by de Broglie. We have seen lambda is equal to h by p or that is h upon under root 2me. This also we have derived when we have to write it in terms of energy. Okay. Now we will also write it in terms of potential because we don't know the energy. We know the applied potential. So we will write it as h upon 2mev. So lambda is equal to you try to write the value of h upon 2 into 9.1 into 10 power minus 31. This is what? This is the mass of the electron. Because here we read the mass, mass of the electron into V, the applied potential is 54 and this is E. What are the values we are taking here for H? 6.625 into 10 power minus 34. And for M, mass of the electron we are taking 9.1 into 10 power minus 31. And uh, E we are taking the charge of the electron 1.6 into 10 power minus 19 and the potential 54 volts. So when we have calculated we got it as 0 0.168 nanometer. So what is the conclusion he has given? So according to de Broglie relation electrons with kinetic energy of 54 volt have a wavelength of 0 0.168 nanometer. And the experimental outcome was 0 0.165. He used the Bragg's law. Why a Bragg's law? He calculated it experimentally. And this is a, so what he got is 0 0.165. This is the theoretical value. This is the experimental value. And they have closely, they are closely matching with the predictions. Predictions means whatever is expected. So what he concluded is, so this accidental discovery of diffraction of electrons was the first evidence confirming the Broglie hypothesis that particles can have wave properties as well. So he did not want to do an experiment to prove the wave nature. It was an accidental discovery because he was experimenting with electron beam and he wanted to study the surface of crystals. But while doing the experiment, he observed that these electrons were undergoing diffraction. So he thought why not we use this to find uh, or to determine the wave nature, whether we can prove the wave nature of electrons. So this helped him to confirm the de Broglie hypothesis that particles also can have wave properties. So what are the practical applications here? We are using them in vacuum tubes. This helped to the discovery of vacuum tubes which are adequately used and they are also reliable and available also. So when we have, whenever we have to use this uh, uh, vacuum tubes, we will have to remember the uh, experiment which was, which helped them to prove the wave nature of electrons. And also scientists use LED diffraction to explore the surface of crystallized elements. So whenever uh, they find different elements in nature, if they have to study their crystalline structure, they use this diffraction method and they also can find the spacing because we are using the Bragg's law uh, n lambda is equal to 2d sin theta where d is the spacing between the atoms. So if that formula is correct, they can apply it to any atom and find the spacing between the atoms. Now what I want to conclude here is Davison's attention in detail means he was uh, paying attention to each and every phenomena or each and every incident that is occurring during the experiment. So attention in detail is very much required while doing the experiment. And his analysis of the results, he just did not ignore some of the things. So when he started observing, he started observing a diffraction pattern, then he thought we can analyze, he analyzed it and he saw that they are undergoing a diffraction pattern. He used it to prove the wave nature. So, and also the resources he had for conducting the research and the expertise of his colleagues all contributed to the experimental success. 
So these are the things when you have to remember whenever you are doing some experiments. So you need to pay um, attention to all minute details, have the required resources and also collaborate. Also, always a teamwork is very, he immediately collaborated with another scientist, Jermer. So Davison and Jermer put together, they are uh, successful in uh, proving the wave nature. So collaboration, using the expertise of his colleagues, all that helped him to achieve success. So I conclude my session here. See you in the next, next session. Thank you. Like, share and subscribe. Hit the bell icon for more updates.